at UCLA, and he'll be talking to us about residual hydrogen helium atmospheres of super Earths. Great, let me share my slides. Okay, I hope you all can see that. So yeah, uh, thank you to the organizers so much for having me. I'm um, Will Meisner, and today I'm excited to tell you about the work I've been doing with uh, Hilke Schlichting at UCLA on the residual hydrogen helium atmospheres of super Earths, uh, which can be preserved by a mechanism we call to cool is to keep. So, I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, a prominent finding in uh, the exoplanet field in the past few years is uh, the discovery of a uh, gap in the radius distribution of uh, small exoplanets between the radii of Earth and Neptune. Uh, and so that's shown by this plot uh, by Fulton et al. of the Kepler sample. It's also been um, uh, found in Ka2 data. And um, you've probably, I think we've seen this plot now at, at least four times in this conference. And so I probably don't need to explain that the planets above the radius uh, gap here um, are more consistent in their densities and radii with uh, rocky planets with um, a hydrogen helium envelope of at least a few percent on top of them, which inflates their observed radii, whereas the planets below the valley are more consistent with super Earth planets. Um, and these are um, consistent with rocky cores with little to no atmosphere on them. Um, and since uh, even planets in the super Earth peak of this distribution are consistent with um, having accreted. Um, atmospheres from the protoplanetary disk um, while the disk was still around. Um, a common hypothesis for how this gap is formed is that all planets started with primordial atmospheres, um, but atmospheric mass loss affected some of these planets more than others. So um, sub-Neptunes were able to retain uh, much of their primordial atmospheres accreted from the protoplanetary disk, while super-Earths um, somehow lost them, and they're observed today as bare cores. And so there are two uh, mechanisms that, uh, of mass loss that best explain the observed um, planet dichotomy and um, how it behaves in period and other um, attributes. Uh, one is photoevaporation, where high energy radiation from the host stars um, drive this atmospheric mass loss by uh, inputting energy into the upper layers of the planet's atmospheres. And the other is core powered mass loss where thermal energy released from the underlying hot silicate cores of these planets um, instead is the energy source that drives the mass loss. And so in this talk, I'll be focusing on the core powered mass loss mechanism. And I'll be specifically focusing on its effect on super Earths. Um, what the imprint core powered mass loss can have on the super Earths that we can observe today. Um, and what imprint this formation process could have had. So, uh, in order to understand this imprint, we need to understand the stages of evolution that such planets go through. So initially, um, once the gas disk disperses, the loss of pressure support from the um, surrounding disk leads to immediate um, mass loss and contraction for both sub-Neptunes and super-Earths. Um, so the disk disperses and these planets immediately lose mass and contract until uh, their radiative convective boundaries are a few times their core radii. Um, and so um, in order for such a planet to become a super Earth and lose most of its atmospheric mass, uh, under core powered mass loss, uh, the um, core's heat capacity must at this point be larger than the atmosphere's heat capacity. Um, if this is the case, um, the core's cooling will significantly impede the atmosphere's ability to contract um, because the core is releasing energy into the atmosphere. And um, mass will continue to be lost hydrodynamically um, uh, in, a high, in a wind from the radiative, launched from the radiative convective boundary. Um, at this point, for a super Earth, the cooling time scale um, will be much longer than the mass loss time scale. And for some planets, this can uh, just proceed. Um, the cooling time scale can never become shorter than the mass loss time scale. Uh, the planet will never cool faster than it loses mass. And the planet will lose mass until um, it is optically thin and no hydrogen or helium is retained. Um, and we'd expect plants like this to be observed today with entirely 
secondary outgassed atmospheres. Um, however, what I'll show you in this talk today is that some planets can follow a different path. Um, eventually, some planets uh, can cool faster than they lose mass. And if this occurs, um, since hydrodynamic mass loss is exponentially sensitive to the radiative convective boundary, um, if these planets are able to cool faster than they lose mass, they'll quickly contract. And this contraction will cut off any further mass loss. And for these planets, a thin hydrogen helium envelope will be retained on gigaer timescales. So how are these planets able to cool faster than they lose mass at the end of core powered mass loss? Uh, well, to show this, uh, this is a numerical simulation I've run of um, a planet's evolution in time. Um, and I show its atmospheric mass um, as a fraction of its total mass, F, um, and as a fraction of its initial atmospheric mass, F over F and it and um, the evolution of its radiative convective boundary. So what we see is at first, um, the planet um, contracts and loses mass fairly quickly, but at a certain point, um, the contraction slows a little bit because the core is releasing energy into the atmosphere, and this, um, yeah, this slows the atmospheric contraction. However, mass continues to be lost via hydrodynamic wind. Uh, and so as mass is lost at a slowly changing radiative convective boundary, the density of the atmosphere will decrease. Um, this decrease in density of the atmosphere makes radiative diffusion across the radiative convective boundary easier. And therefore, the luminosity of the planet um, will increase as mass is lost. Meanwhile, the core is thermally coupled to the base of the atmosphere. Um, and this means that the core's thermal energy um, depends only on the um, radiative convective boundary location because it depends on the thermal structure of the atmosphere. Uh, this makes it independent of the atmospheric mass um, and dependent only on the radiative convective boundary. And therefore, the cooling time scale, the ratio of the core's energy to the luminosity of the planet, will decrease as the planet loses mass. Meanwhile, the mass loss rate um, depends linearly on the atmospheric mass and exponentially on the radiative convective boundary location. And therefore, the mass loss time scale, the ratio of the atmospheric mass to the, to the mass loss rate, is independent of the atmospheric mass and increases as the planet slowly shrinks. In this way, uh, the cooling time scale can become less than the mass loss time scale, which is shown in, uh, by the red line on this, on this plot. Uh, at this point, the rate of convective boundary will quickly continue to contract. Uh, and whatever atmosphere that remains at this point will be preserved. Uh, so, uh, and we want to understand what kinds of atmospheres these plants might be left with after core powered mass loss. And in order to do so, we come up with ana I derived analytic um, time scales, co cooling and mass loss time scales um, to assess uh, at what atmospheric mass fraction this occurs. And so uh, my analytic derivations are um, shown by these uh, proportionalities. And so again, the mass loss time scale is independent of the atmospheric mass but exponentially dependent on the core mass and equilibrium temperature. Meanwhile, the cooling time scale um, is over um, super Earth parameters only weakly dependent on the core mass and equilibrium temperature, but linearly dependent on the atmospheric mass fraction that remains. And so um, these two um, analytic approximations are plotted in these two figures as a function of core mass and equilibrium temperature. And what we see is, again, that the mass loss time scale increases exponentially with mass and decreases exponentially with temperature. Um, and depending on your core mass and equilibrium temperature, uh, the cooling time scale uh, will intersect it and eventually become less than, the atmos become less than it uh, for very different atmospheric masses varying by many orders of magnitude. Um, and so what we want to find is this intersection point for a given planet, for a planet at a known core mass and equilibrium temperature, what atmospheric mass um, remains when the cooling time scale becomes less than the mass loss time scale. And so we can solve for, we can set the cooling and mass loss time scales equal to each other and solve for the critical atmospheric mass or the atmospheric mass we expect to be retained. Um, and uh, I would show the, its dependence on the core mass and equilibrium temperature here. Um, and so again, we expect this atmospheric mass to vary exponentially with the core mass and equilibrium temperature. Um, and we expect larger and um, cooler planets to be able to retain more atmospheric mass 
and uh, less massive and hotter planets to retain less. Um, and this is uh, borne out by the numerical simulations that complement these results, uh, which I show here. So I show five different um, planets. Our baseline case is this yellow dashed line. Um, and so for a hotter and smaller, the hotter and smaller planets shown by the yellow dotted line for the smaller planet and the uh, red dashed line for the hotter planet uh, end up losing more mass than our baseline, whereas the um, less the cooler shown by the blue line and the uh, more massive planet shown by the solid line um, lose less mass than our dashed line. Um, and so um, broadly the trends that we derive analytically we see in the numerical results that um, yeah that hotter and um, less massive planets are able to hold on to less of their atmospheres but still are able to retain 10 to the minus four um, of their total planet mass, which, you know, uh, in the scheme of terrestrial planets is a fairly thick um, hydrogen helium envelope. Um, and so what are the effects of this uh, residual hydrogen helium? Well, um, these planets um, with these hydrogen helium envelopes uh, could have very different um, surface ge geochemistries and um, uh, habitability considerations um, due to this uh, residual hydrogen, since hydrogen is a very strong reducing gas. Um, and so that's something that needs to be taken into account. Um, this hydrogen helium also has pretty large effects on the observability of these planets. Um, so I just show here the uh, scale heights of an isothermal atmosphere composed of hy primordial hydrogen and helium versus water um, as a function of core mass and equilibrium temperature. And the, since hydrogen and helium have a much smaller mean molecular weight than does water or other secondary species, um, it ends up having a scale height that's almost 10 times as large, which um, is a difference that could be observed by near future um, atmospheric retrievals. So um, just to conclude, the thermal coupling of a super Earth's core and atmosphere allows the cooling time scale to decrease below the mass loss time scale at the end stages of core barred mass loss. And in this way, super Earths can hold on to small residual hydrogen helium envelopes whose masses vary many orders of magnitude, but can in some cases be substantial. Um, and these retained hydrogen helium atmospheres uh, would have significant effects on the subsequent surface and atmospheric evolution of these planets and potentially could be observed. And with that, I'd love to take any questions. I see a couple people talk, typing in the Slack, so I'll give that a second. I guess in the meantime, um, you say that it's testable by near future atmospheric retrievals. Uh, what do you mean by that in what's kind of near future scale? Well, so my understanding at least is that more and more of the most recent atmospheric retrievals are starting to push into the kind of Neptune, sub-Neptune regime. Um, of uh, kind of planet mass and planet radius. And so um, since these super Earths, even if they don't seem like they would have hydrogen, if they have hydrogen, that makes them um, a lot more observable um, because their scale heights are 10 times as large. And so I think it's conceivable that a kind of, you know, 1.7 Earth radius planet could be if it has a hydrogen atmosphere and it's not too hazy, which, you know, is often a problem, um, then maybe you could tell the difference between it and uh, like a secondary dominated atmosphere. I see, cool, thanks. All right, we have a couple of questions down in the Slack uh, from Marshall Johnson. Can you say a little more about the observational predictions of your model? Yeah, um, that's kind of related. So I would say, I would predict that um, a substantial number of super Earths in kind of a certain regime where they don't undergo this catastrophic mass loss and where they are able to cool, are able to retain um, primordial gas in their atmospheres. That would be my main observational prediction and that you could, that if these atmos if these super earth atmospheres have a low mean molecular weight, then they presumably held on to this hydrogen somehow, because um, I don't think it's too likely to be outcast. Although some people like Edwin Kite have looked at that. Thanks. Uh, one final question that we seem to have time for. Yeah. Um, 
You may have mentioned this and I missed it, but are you simultaneously estimating the relative fraction of helium and hydrogen, helium versus hydrogen mm. routine? Are these regimes where the atmosphere is significantly enriched in helium versus hydrogen? So that's not something we've explicitly looked at um, in this model. Um, I would expect, so the mass is being lost hydrodynamically, and so I would expect there isn't very much um, fractionation um, between helium and hydrogen. And so it's like the mass loss rates are high enough, I think, that it would train and train everything. And then um, once mass loss stops, you wouldn't expect too much fractionation. Um, but it would probably be, maybe in certain edge cases, you could get enrichment. But I would say typically, I wouldn't expect it. Great, thanks. That's all the time that we have for questions. Thank you again. For a great talk. Yeah.